Okay, so picture the scene. It's August, it's 1940. The Battle of Britain has begun and there are bombs dropping on London pretty much every night. Now you've just been appointed Prime Minister, so I'm Churchill, that's right. And you, Churchill, just like everybody in the country, is asking themselves the question, how long have we got until we have German boots on British soil? Now you turn up to your office and you open your calendar, you take a look and it's, as usual, pretty packed. And you know what that's like better than anyone. But then all of a sudden you spot something that you never see, a gap a 20 minute gap of unallocated time. What are you gonna do with it? I don't know, work on one of your battle plans for the next night. Yeah, you'd think, right, but you don't. Instead, you call your secretary into your office and you tell her you'd like to dictate a memo and the memo goes like this. To do our work, we all have to read a mass of papers. Nearly all of them are far too long. This waste time while energy has to be spent in looking for the essential points. I ask my colleagues and their staffs to see to it that their reports are shorter. So a time of existential crisis, um, when he should have been working on battle plans and other things, he's essentially dictating a style guide to his secretary about how to write more clearly and concisely. Yeah, oh. right. which sounds completely crazy, but this is Churchill and he's not crazy and what he knows is that the ability of his senior team, his generals and whatnot, their ability to transmit information and ideas effectively could be the difference between life and death. He knew that it didn't matter how brilliant they were, how well thought up their plans were, or how strong the military intelligence was that they'd managed to gather if they couldn't communicate it. Because great thinking without great communication withers on the vine. And at a time like this, we couldn't afford for that to happen. But that's not actually my point. So what is? Okay, well, roll forwards a few months and Churchill writes the following. We had another memo. Forgive this cry of pain. The number and length of messages are no measure of efficiency. So his original memo hadn't worked. Yep, and then roll forwards a few more years and he writes this. In 1940, I called for brevity. Evidently, I must do so again. I ask my colleagues to read what I wrote then and to make my wishes known to their staffs. Crikey, this was Churchill, but even Churchill, a national hero, couldn't get everyone to adopt the advice he was putting out there. Because it turns out that no memo, no style guide, simply transforms everyone around them into a culture of great communication, regardless of the godlike status of the person asking you to do it. So if Churchill can't do it, there's not much hope for the rest of us. Yeah, because it turns out you can't just command people to communicate better. They would if they could, thing is they don't know how and to make things even worse a lot of what we're taught at school the so-called tenets of good communication actually make it worse now you and I we've spent the last decade and two decades really working with executives across all sorts of organizations to work out how to help good thinking to travel we spent years working out what are the communication conventions that don't work which are the ones that do work and how to make them really easy to adopt you'll find lots more all about this in our book helping everyone to get the thinking out of their heads so that others can act on it.